Well, welcome to the uh, final session of the afternoon. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, tail risk management and uh, using uh, different strategies to manage that tail risk. We're uh, very uh, fortunate uh, to have uh, three panelists today uh, that have uh, each over 20 years of experience in their respective uh, uh, businesses and in the investment business. Uh, you know, back in the, in the 1920s, uh, Will Rogers uh, said, uh, don't gamble. Uh, take all of your savings and put it uh, into some good stocks. Let the stocks go up and then sell them. If they don't go up, don't buy them. <laughs> Unfortunately, since 2000, uh, it's been a little more difficult than that. Uh, with uh, the internet bubble and then 9-11 and obviously since the financial crisis. Uh, managing downside risk has become a very important aspect of our overall business. Uh, and uh, today we're honored to, uh, to have these three panelists to uh, discuss that. When we started our firm many years ago, we basically said that we really don't want to take any capital market assumptions at all. Can we define managing money, not by managing money, but by mathematically building models? that are not dependent on any capital market. You know, when you use the word assume, as everybody knows, you make an ass out of you and me. So can we build models that are not dependent on any of you? And that's really the focus of our firm. We can send a person to the moon with precision accuracy, but yet we can't tell our clients with a high degree of certainty that we hit the financial goals. Well, they're rocket science. Does that mean that our business is more complicated than rocket science? So what I, what I want to do is I want to just jump a little bit into the process because I think, unfortunately, when you get statements like Warren Buffett that said derivatives are weapons of financial mass destruction, most people don't understand he was talking about a certain type of derivative, but understand that Warren Buffett is one of the biggest users of exchange-traded options in the market. So what I'd like to do is just get into a basic process, a couple of basic processes how you can use derivatives very effectively to really eliminate and manage tailwinds. So what we have here is a simple P&L. Um, and let's talk about the first strategy. Let's assume we have an asset XYZ asset. So we have unlimited upside, we have unlimited downside. So what if we can buy a long protected put at, at the spot, at, at the money, that's a very expensive proposition. We don't do that because it's too expensive and the firms that do it need to time it. But once you time, you're back into making a capital market assumption. I think the markets are going down, so I'm going to put a protect and put onto the portfolio. Well, what if you could, in a sense, let's say defray some of that downside variance. Uh, in this particular example, one to two standard deviations out of the money. In other words, introduce risk back into the PL by maybe selling an out of the money put. Well, the first thing you might say is that an out of the money put is going to be, is not going to finance that out of the money put. And what you're going to essentially do is you're going to reduce your downside. You're giving up alpha on the spot. Because if you own, let's say, XYZ asset and you buy a protective put and you sell an out of money protective put, yeah, you are you, you have a hedge of one, two standard deviations. And then you have to say, how do you define a standard deviation? We don't like to use the parametric symmetrical Gaussian model. We actually use a history. So what's interesting though is in this basic strategy. One thing we know about options is that options, the cost of an option equals the square root of time. What does that mean in English? Well, if I'm buying a 16-day option and it costs me $4, does that mean that a 48-day option costs me $12? No. A 144-day option costs me $12. So what if I sold short-term to finance long-term? And when you do that, what happens is now you can actually reduce the cost of that hedge to a very very small amount, depending on the skew. And, and we've been in a reverse skew since 1987. So what does that mean? That means that I'm, I'm getting a higher implied volatility as I go down and strike. So, so I'm getting a lot of money for that short put, short term, to finance that long term. And what I have here is a very nice P&L. Now you may argue this doesn't eliminate tailwinds. 
Well, if we have a three sigma event, and I'm hedged one and a half standard deviation, for my clients, that's a one and a half, that's a one and a half standard deviation event. That's not a, that's not a 99 or, or a four or five sigma event. Let's talk about, and then of course, I could always reintroduce another long put farther out of the money to define maximum loss. Let's talk about one other basic strategy. Well, what if I replace that with a future contract? Okay, very simple. Okay, so let's just use an example. I have $700,000 in the market. Your client has $700,000 in the market. You tell your client, listen, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna take that $700,000 and we're gonna buy a notional value of teacher's contracts that represents $700,000. So if we look at any mini contract with a multiplier of 50, the S&P right now is what, 1381, let's say 1400 times 50, that means each contract carries a notional value of $70,000. Okay, well that's pretty good. If I have $700,000, so to represent 700,000, 70 into 7, uh, 700,000, I have to buy 10 contracts, e mini contracts. And what is the uh, CME that it charge me in margin? $5,600. Okay, so to, to essentially it's going to cost me about $56,000, 10 contracts times $5,600. $56,000. I now have a dollar for dollar notional representation of the S&P 500. Okay, now what do I have? I have a lot of cash. What can I do with that cash? Well, we can, we hear about, we learn about portable alpha, where we can maybe get excess return or benchmark by investing that that cash, because that spot's gonna give you a pretty good representation of the market. What's nice about the S&P contracts today is that interest rates are lower than dividend. So that means I'm in a constant backwardation. So I'm not paying for that wall cost if I was in Virginia. I'm not excited. So now I can take that money, what can I do with it? Well, maybe I can invest it now. In 2009, November of 2009, a one-year treasury was paying me 315 basis points. So that would be really nice. In 2009, I could take that money and kicks off 315 in, uh, a year. What do I do with that money? I can buy a head. I can buy maybe a protective foot. Maybe I can buy uh, a long-term VIX, which is a very nice hurricane contract. But today, I can't do that. Because right now, today, a three-year treasury is giving us about 20, 29 basis points. So it's not getting, taking off any type of income to cover the cost of that head. So I have to get a little bit, you have to get a little bit creative here. We've talked to, we listened to some of the speakers uh, today, they've talked about various strategies, whether it's real estate. One of the things that we like to do at our firm is we say, okay, what can we do? What's acceptable to our client? Well, we have to write corporate debt. Well, once we, once we bring in corporate debt, we introduce the default risk, so you say, great, you might be eliminating systematic risk by buying the future and then the hedging off. But now, are you if you buy if you buy let's say corporate debt or municipal debt or if you come down on the on the curve and you buy in the, the quality curve and you buy maybe a higher yield bond, then what are you doing? You're trading systematic risk with default risk. So how do we mitigate default risk? Well, diversification number one. Number two, maybe we go short term, if we go two year uh, duration on those bonds. And number three, we work with our bond manager. We say, hey, we want short term, we want good diversification, and what we want to do is uh, we'll be willing to come down. And the third thing we want is absolute maturity on that portfolio. Why? Because I don't want interest rate rates. Because we're trying to come up with a no cost hedge. So our, our, our bond manager says, okay, you know what? If you're willing to get a basket of eight bonds with a duration of two years, and, and we, can, we can give us 400 basis points a year, I just cover the cost of my head. So what I've got is I get 100% move on my future, I'm taking my cash, and I'm financing my head, and you can do it with a protective foot, you can do it with a fixed call option, there's a lot of things you can do, and, and you just eliminate the limited detail. 